This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. This is the first of three chapters dealing with the information, information technology part of the syllabus. And first of all, just a few uh, little kind of definitions. First of all, uh, we uh, need to distinguish between data and information. So data is basically raw fact. So if you had a, a list of just every outstanding invoice, uh, perhaps a, a list in date order or a list in a sequential invoice number, that would be data. It would be correct, it would be fine. Uh, and this can be used to make the detailed debits uh, in the uh, customer's accounts. Uh, however, just a list of invoices uh, in invoice number order with uh, the, uh, the, the the dates and the uh, customer details and the amount of the invoice is not actually very informative. Uh, we can't do very much with this very large list of invoices. Uh, it hasn't really got any particular structure to it. Uh, and information uh, really only exists when data has meaning. Uh, so in other words, the data is presented or summarized or perhaps processed in some way uh, that you can get some meaning from it. And of course, the, the typical way in which this big list of invoices is going to be processed is it is debited to each customer's account uh, and ultimately you can find out what each customer owes and that's quite informative. And then what you can do is you can look at what that customer owes, you can look at the invoice dates uh, and you can produce age listings uh, where the old debts are, where the new debts are and so on. And of course this is going to be information which is going to be terribly useful for for credit management and credit control. So data of itself has to be held uh, but data of itself not very useful to ourselves. It's all to do with the way it's presented, sorted, displayed manipulated uh, and then it becomes informative, it becomes information. Now what then is knowledge uh, and and hard to hard to define that really uh, but knowledge uh, can be defined as information in somebody's mind or information in somebody's head. You could have uh, up here you can have your sales ledger and it could be sitting in a, a big printout in the corner, really. Uh, it's got data in it, it has information in it, but actually unless a person reads it, or perhaps increasingly a, a machine who can apply intelligence to it, but until it is looked at with intelligence is rather useless. It's only when a person looks at this and says, gosh, uh, we, we shouldn't send any more goods to that person because they're not paying or these people have been paying really well and uh, maybe what we should do is kind of voluntarily raise their credit limit to try to encourage them to order even more and, and so on. So knowledge is information in somebody's mind uh, and really there are then two types of knowledge. First there is explicit knowledge and you can think of explicit knowledge as, as somewhere it is written down. It's kind of quite obvious, explicit. It's uh, knowledge that we know we have and know where to find it and so on. And by and large, uh, there isn't much danger about that. If it is written down, it's got a, or, or recorded on a, on, on a computer file. By and large, it has a sort of permanence. You, you can search through the, the, the files and so on, and the documents and so on, uh, to actually find the specific bits of information or knowledge you want. The tricky bit with knowledge is what's called tacit or silent knowledge. And by and large, it is not written. It really exists only in somebody's mind. It isn't in somebody's mind and written. It is just in somebody's brain. So it could be, uh, for example, that your senior salesperson 
knows the names of the key contacts in all of the customers, but hasn't written that down anywhere. It could be uh, that your senior sales person uh, knows and, and keeps in his or her mind uh, information which is basically saying, well, I think in three months they're going to order these parts or this big machine. I think in two months they're going to make a decision about something else. Uh, but again, it's not written down. And one of the problems is, what happens if this salesperson leaves? They leave with this knowledge in their head. Even if they don't use it somewhere else, they're leaving a, a gap in the knowledge that can be used by the company. Second problem is if they don't uh, share this knowledge with other people, then of course the use being made of it is very restricted. Uh, information is usually better when it's uh, shared so that lots of different people can try to make sense of it, if you like, uh, and to apply that information, increasing profitability. So the big challenge really uh, is getting tacit knowledge out of people's heads, really. Uh, to be written, to be shared, to be codified so people can find it. It's sometimes said that the tacit or silent or almost secret knowledge has become more of a problem as we've moved from manufacturing organisations to service organisations. It's very easy to specify exactly how a product is made. You've got diagrams, uh, you have got uh, photographs, you have instructions, you have parts lists of exactly how a product is made. So that's all uh, essentially information which is absolutely explicit. But if you're running a hotel or a restaurant and it's a successful hotel or a restaurant, it can sometimes be much more difficult to pinpoint and to write down and to define what makes these service organizations more successful than another. What is it about the maybe the way they handle their customers or the way they recruit and train and treat staff and so on that makes one bar or restaurant very, very successful and another one almost identical makes it a bit of a failure. And it'd be really good if we could get out of the, the manager, let's say, of a successful restaurant exactly how they work their magic uh, because that then could be uh, maybe a formula which could be applied throughout the organization. So what we need to do is to try to uncover this knowledge. And of course, people don't even know they have it quite often. They just do things automatically. Uh, and they don't know, uh, you know, luckily it works very well, but they're not quite sure of what their secret is to being a good, let's say, salesperson or a welcoming uh, host in a hotel. You want to record it, you want to kind of capture it so that if this person leaves, you, you've left a, a trace of it. You want to distribute it around the company so that other people can use it. You want to lever it. And lever means knowledge which has been discovered for one purpose, we can maybe apply to another purpose. Uh, so it could be, if you're an international organization, uh, something that's maybe been tried out and has been very successful in the USA, uh, what we can do is to say, well, it worked jolly well there. Uh, perhaps maybe have to change just how, how we treat customers a little bit, but we might be able to apply the, the lessons there, uh, maybe to markets in Europe. And finally, we have to update this knowledge. Knowledge and information and data is continually changing, uh, and we mustn't just do this as a one-sort exercise and then think, well, that's knowledge management sorted, we need to look at it again. Now, when it comes to IT configurations, how uh, uh, is basically the hardware arranged? Uh, most hardware, most companies nowadays uh, uh, arrange their hardware on the basis of networks. So we have kind of three types of networks here. You have a local area network and a local area network would be something which might be in a university. It might be in a hospital. 
it might be in a company. But basically, the, the geographical area is, is fairly restricted. It's one campus, one university, it's one hospital, installation, and so on. And what that tends to happen with local area networks is you install special wiring uh, around the university, or around the hospital, or around the company. And the information is shared between the people on the network through this special wiring, like sometimes it's Ethernet wiring. So basically what you have is maybe a, a, a whole a lot of machines in the network, and basically they're all linked to each other. It's not actually very efficient linking them in a, in a ring like this, because maybe information, you know, if you have, want to get information from here to here, it has to go to, through to other machines. There are all sorts of different uh, ways in which the machines can be linked. So the information put in here, uh, can be used by someone over here. It is shared. A wide area network uh, is to typically uh, the, the components, many of them are geographically separate. Uh, you could have uh, people in different towns uh, or different countries. <coughs> so typically what you have is maybe in the UK, you have your UK office with its local area network, and then maybe in Germany, uh, in Frankfurt or somewhere, uh, you've got your German uh, company with its network there. And obviously you can't really lay down your own cable between Frankfurt and London. That's going to be terribly expensive. So, so what it uses basically is public communication systems. The, it's basically the telephone system. So it's transmitted over basically telephone communications very, very quickly, of course, uh, and, and this basically links uh, remote uh, installations and brings you into a wide area network. So if these are, this is one company, so this is our UK division, this is our German division. It may, however, be useful if these divisions could for example, communicate with a supplier, something outside the organization. So out here we might have a supplier. And a supplier might have its own little kind of network. They're all kind of linked up. And what we want to do is we want to send orders automatically to our supplier when we need goods. So rather than printing stuff out and putting it in the ordinary post and so on here, uh, uh, wouldn't it just be great if what we could have was some form of kind of uh, communication uh, from within our network to outside our network? And this is called an extranet. So extra uh, outside our own network. Uh, so we can uh, look maybe at uh, customers, we can look at suppliers, uh, we can uh, do all sorts of linkages here which can be extremely uh, efficient for us to use. What we've kind of depicted here is basically a wired network. Uh, but of course, almost certainly you will have used uh, a Wi-Fi network. In other words, a wireless network. So if you're staying in a hotel, if you're traveling, if you're in an airport, maybe if you're in a restaurant, uh, and you get this kind of little symbol coming up on your phone or something of that sort. This means that you are essentially connecting by radio uh, signals to, let's say, the Internet. It doesn't have to be connected to the Internet. Uh, these uh, uh, cables that we have going around the office do not actually have to be cables anymore. Each of these could really be uh, communicating to the other one by radio kind of frequency and so on. Advantages? Well, you have to wire the place up. Disadvantages is that Wi-Fi is normally uh, only efficient over a relatively short distance. Uh, so if you were why, you know, if you were doing this by Wi-Fi, then uh, you know you, cer you certainly have to be in the same building, uh, maybe even the same room to get good communication. But it also means that you're not kind of tethered to your desk. So you can do this. It's very, very useful for laptops that you're going to be moving around the place. 
uh, you can move from your desk to a conference room to somewhere else. The Wi-Fi is uh, installed in, in various different rooms in the organization and it gives you great uh, flexibility. 3G and 4G <coughs> is basically communicating by mobile phone technology. So you're out of the office, uh, not in a hotel or any of the Wi-Fi, you're kind of on the road maybe. Uh, and what you can do is you can essentially uh, access the internet or access your company's network through mobile phone technology. And again, we were almost certainly all, all done that. Uh, we've on our smartphones, we've accessed the internet, our emails or train times or something, even if Wi-Fi is not available in that particular spot. Again, this gives great freedom. We're not tied to having to find a Wi-Fi hotspot and so on. Uh, and so, for example, salespeople, when they're out at uh, a client trying to clinch a sale and so on, uh, if the sale is uh, made, then they can immediately kind of type into their laptop and action the sale. Uh, and offer goes to head offers by the uh, mobile phone uh, system and it's acted on instantly. Or if they want to find out, is something an inventory? Uh, they can do it again immediately by 3G, 4G. 3G, 4G means third generation or fourth generation, really to get any sort of speed going on in uh, uh, mobile phone type of uh, data transfer. You want to be 4G. Cloud technology. Now, in, uh, the, in the old days, I want to put it like that, uh, if you had, uh, you know, six, let's say, computers in a network, in an office, all wired up in some way, it doesn't really matter what, what the particular configuration is, but everyone's kind of working in these here. Typically, each one of these would have its copy of Word and Excel. You know, it's very common business software. So Word for doing the word processing, Excel for doing the spreadsheets. And there, there were certain cost disadvantages to this. You had to buy six copies of Word and Excel and so on. Uh, but the real kind of problem was, or a real problem was, what happens if the version of Word or the version of Windows even uh, what happens if it is upgraded? Uh, so instead of having, you know, I don't know what Word's got up to now, but instead of having Word 10, uh, the the latest one, and maybe a much better one, is Word version 11 or something. This means that uh, you have to go around, in this case, and this is only a small example, six machines, and update the version of Word in those six machines or get their operators to update it. And you can be sure uh, that somebody doesn't bother updating it. And maybe they end up with software which is a bit incompatible. So there was, there was one uh, kind of uh, uh, problem which, which there was. Uh, and the cloud will give us easier software updates when we see how it actually works. Another uh, problem was that if you, let's say, you're using Excel, and let's say that from time to time, you had to do some quite complicated calculations which required a lot of computing power. It's maybe easier to see in, in certain graphics programs. Graphics programs tend to consume, you know, for designing and so on. Graphics programs tend to be very power hungry. And if you're six people, uh, occasionally had to run a power-hungry application, it meant that every computer that we had here had to be quite powerful. It had to be powerful enough to run this power-hungry graphics program, even though you might only need to do it once a month. Uh, you had to have this computing power kind of ready and in reserve in each of the machines. Now, basically, what the the cloud 
uh, approach says is it says uh, we don't need a, really a copy of Word or the graphics program or, or Excel uh, in every machine. What we'll have is our, our machines, whatever number it, it particularly comes to, to there. And what we'll have is, is, is kind of what they call the cloud. But basically you have a big machine somewhere. So basically, the cloud, you know, it isn't it isn't too amorphous. It is a big machine somewhere, and this has a copy of Word and Excel and the graphics. And what I do uh, here, if I want to do a bit of spreadsheet work, basically I see an image of the spreadsheet, but the the spreadsheet is actually resident and sitting in. The cloud in this big machine and all I'm doing is working through a little interface or if I'm doing graphics I can see the results I can then move things with my mouse and my machine but the actual work has been done here uh, and all this machine does then is to send me uh, the results which is basically the picture if you like which I'm creating Great thing about this is that if you have to update the software, you need to do it in one place. So everyone down here is going to be dealing with an absolutely consistent version of the software. The second great thing is that if each of these people only has to kind of do the graphics program, you know, once a month or something like that, uh, then they don't all need don't any of them need powerful machines. What they do, basically, is really all the heavy lifting has been done here. This needs to be a powerful machine. And the chances of maybe two people, three people having to, to do the power-hungry processing at the same time is actually relatively remote. So these can all be kept what we usually call thin clients. In other words, they're not very powerful. They're, they're, they're not much more than an interface, uh, and you have all the all the work being done in the cloud. And 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 in some uh, systems, if you become really, really, really uh, uh, processor hungry for a short time, it it can kind of bring in other resources and so on. Uh, it can almost enlarge your uh, uh, experience of the cloud. For, for a short time, you know, for half an hour, and then it goes back to normal. So it gives a very, very flexible access, flexible processing and so on. It's, it's going to be cheaper in the software. It gives you access to the powerful processing. Software only has to be updated in one place. Easy maintenance. This is really the only place that has to be fixed up here. And flexible processing and access. Disadvantages? Well, if these communication lines uh, break down, or indeed this up here breaks down, then uh, pretty much these little clients will be uh, not able to do very much useful at all. You kind of are a bit dependent on the communication working. And some people get a little bit uh, irritated that uh, usually are the cloud and the cloud machines are held by third parties, large computing companies who put a lot of computing power into the cloud and then this computing power is shared out not only amongst the users in one company but it's shared out amongst different companies so that everyone can you know go up and down in, in terms of the amount of power they're actually consuming and some people say well do I really want, you know, lots of confidential data, maybe about design or uh, customers and so on? Do I really want that data be, to be resident and held in a third-party machine? And they begin to get a little anxious about its safety.